Welcome to Transformations with Tara. This is Tara Sutphin. And my guest today is Dr. Mark Plotkin, one of my very best friends. And hey, Mark is just amazing. You know, he's a Harvard ethnobotanist. Uh, just he's he just helps us on the planet so much as far as keeping our our plants in order and our medicines for the future. And thank you, Mark, for all the thank great you, work Tara. that you do. And uh, he has a new podcast and you know, has many books, you know, and his latest book was the Amazon, what everyone needs to know. And, but the podcast, tell me about the podcast. And then we have Jason too, our co-host. Thank you, Jason, oh, for being on the show. Yeah, thank you. Good. Good to be with you, Tara and Jason, once again. Yeah, uh, the podcast is called Plants of the Gods. It's homage to my mentor, Richard Schultes, his uh, classic book, Plants of the Gods, which he did with Albert Hoffman, who was the inventor of LSD. And the idea is to look at these plants and fungi and, and even some of the hallucinant principles we're finding in animals and look at their healing possibilities, uh, but not just the therapeutic potential, but the impact they've had on culture and art and literature and creativity. We in fact create, coined a new term called an ideogen. People talk about these compounds as hallucinogens because they induce hallucinations. Uh, people thought that was sort of too limited. So they started talking about entheogens, releasing the God within. Others talk about empathogens because they make you feel connected to the universe, which is a message, Terry, you always sharing with friends and, and fans like me. But I thought there was something lacking and that is the impact of these mind altering substances on creativity. The uh, Roman poet Horace said, no poem was ever written by a drinker of water. Uh, <laughs> that, that That's hilarious. I'm gonna drink my water now. <laughs> have at it uh, and have wine afterwards. But remember that PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, which has impacted everything from our understanding of ancient DNA to solving cold cases came about because Carrie Mullis out in your neck of the woods was tooling down Big Sur after taking LSD and came up with this crazy idea. So that the, the point of the podcast is not just to say, hey dude, I, I found the greatest strain of dope. You gotta try it, which a lot of these podcasts do. But to look at how these uh, compounds have impacted our, our civilization and uh, actually our proto-civilization. And I don't wanna spend the whole hour on this, but I, I will make uh, one point here. And that is that there is a theory called the stoned ape theory in an attempt to explain why humans became humans 100,000 years ago when their brains just blossomed. Uh, Terence McKenna, the late Terence McKenna said, it's because that's when these primates discovered magic mushrooms. Now, here's the coda to that. There's also the drunk monkey hypothesis, which said, no, it wasn't magic mushrooms. It was wine grapes. Uh, when primates like to eat the ripest fruit because they're the sweetest fruits and some of them fall on the forest floor and began to ferment that they were catching a buzz, not from psilocybin, but from alcohol. So the question is, was it mushrooms or was it wine? And my answer is, why choose? It can be both. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so. There are so many, you know, uh, hallucinogens in the world. I mean, what what would you say is like safe? You know, we've talked about it, you know, just recently right. that there have been a lot of renta shamans that you go out and, you know, they're they're doing a lot of maybe damage. I mean, we don't know yet. It's, it's true. It's a problem. And, and a bigger problem is people can buy all this stuff off the Internet. OK. <laughs> And, and one of the points I make when I talk to people or in the Plants of the Gods podcast or on the Amazon team website is don't do this by yourself. Everybody needs a guide. Ideally, that guide should be a shaman. And if you're taking magic mushrooms, it should be a female shaman in Oaxaca. Uh, or if you're taking ayahuasca, it should be a shaman in the Northwest Amazon, where I also work. Not everybody has the luxury of being able to do that. But the idea that, oh, well, it comes from a plant, so it can't hurt me. My response to that is, have you ever heard of strict nine? <laughs> so we're in this interesting area where people have an increased appreciation for gifts like yours, Tara, 
uh, mediums and people who can enter altered states uh, just through trancing, just through meditation, just through pounding a drum. Uh, the rest of us mere mortals need some of these natural substances to get access to some of those states. But the point is on the one hand that people have an, uh, uh, increased appreciation. On the other hand, people are overdoing it and thinking that hallucinogens are the panacea and the cure for everything. If you read Michael Pollan's uh, book, How to Change Your Mind, which is a wonderful book on the subject, he points out that many of the people who are seeking out these uh, mind altering substances are people who are emotionally fragile. And that's the last people who should be doing this, especially A, without supervision, or B, worse, under the supervision of rent shamans who are in it for the money and, 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 and the power and, and sometimes even right. the sex. So, right, because you were saying like the toad, that toad medicine is not, it's not safe. Well, I, I have an interview with Hamilton Morris coming up. I know a lot of people know Hamilton Morris through his show on Vice. And he talked about these guys did some toad. And one of them woke up dead. And when yeah. he couldn't breathe, the other guy was in a trance and he couldn't do anything, which is why these plants are, as I like to say, biological scalpels. Uh, they can heal and they can hurt. And this is what people need to understand. To quote another uh, poet from ancient Rome, Cave, Cave, Cave Canon. No, that's wrong one, beware of dog. Uh, Let the buyer beware. My Latin fails me. Uh, and so, Yes, we have more access to it. Yes, more people are figuring out how to grow mushrooms, but these are not toys. This is not having a beer or having a joint with your buddies. This is something that needs to be treated as it is, which is both sacred and uh, sacred. potentially potentially dangerous, which is what happens when you misuse sacred things, sacred objects, uh, sacred beliefs. Well, even rec powers. recreational drugs, you know, can you know, everybody wants to like alter their life, but um, and maybe, you know, like, just can we just get rid of the blocks, but I don't know necessarily if you're getting rid of the blocks, if you're doing recreational overdoing, you know, prayers and sacred ceremony, sacred ceremony is, you know, I mean, it, it, it does help you like get past your stuff. You know, Tara, this is right in the headlines, Supreme Court overturned abortion. Now, how many people no. believe there won't be any more abortions? Okay. <laughs> It's going to make them more dangerous. They're still going to happen. You know, how's the, how is making prostitution illegal stop prostitution? It doesn't. Okay, human nature is human nature. The yeah. point being is that you need controls uh, for all of these things. It shouldn't be anybody who wants anything should get anything they can. But here's the irony, okay? Uh, marijuana is increasingly legal across the states, not completely, but alcohol and tobacco are completely legal. Now, which is more dangerous? Uh, if you're an ethnobotanist and you've studied cannabis from a scientific perspective, uh, you can't help but uh, think of the adage that if you give five guys uh, all the alcohol they want, they'll start a fight. If you give five guys all the dope they want, they'll start a band. <laughs> that's true too you know <laughs> so i mean you can't legislate everything you if you make stuff illegal it just doesn't it, it just drives it underground so how do we do this in a way and i think we're seeing some of the success with marijuana that you you legalize it you control it and you have people pay taxes so instead of going to drug lords in Colombia, they're building hospitals in the inner city yeah. That's a that's a win-win situation. That's a win. But you can't say that dope doesn't have a, a downside. I know people whose lives are yeah, we should have more music any. than ever. It's like, come on, America. <laughs> more music, fewer fights. <laughs> right. That's right. That's hilarious. Now, now this is in my podcast. I did three episodes on cannabis because I think it's so important and so misunderstood. Yeah. One is the botany of cannabis, which very people uh, understand. The second is hemp. Hemp built this country. George Washington grew it. Thomas Jefferson grew it. We won World War II uh, with hemp as our preeminent fiber. And then the third one I call, the third episode I called Jews, Jazz, and Joints. And as a New Orleanian, I know the jazz began in New Orleans. And as an ethnobotanist, I know it began in New Orleans because that's where cannabis entered the country through the port in New Orleans. So that is why I think the, the power of these plants and these fungi extends far beyond uh, alkaloids that make you trip. 
And tell tell me who is making this cameo appearance. This is Everest. Hi, Everett. Say hi. Uh oh, she hi, can't Carol. hear you. Oh. She can't uh, hear you because of the thing. She can see they me. just wave. Hi. Wave. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hi, Everett. She has a lost tooth. And the tooth fairy came in and saw her last night. Yeah. She's yeah. lucky. Brought lady. you lots of money. You know, when I was a kid, the tooth fairy gave me a dime per tooth. Oh, wow. I, the inflation That's, happened. She got, how much yeah. did you get? What's oh. it up to now? Two fives. What? So, so are the Republicans going to blame uh, us for losing the tooth? Or are they going to blame us for the inflation that costs more than a dime? <laughs> Probably both. <laughs> Probably both. Right. When I was a boy. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you, you, know, you went in. Fun. You ran right into it, Jason. <laughs> Teeth were. But there, there's another point I want to make here, and that is that <laughs> these altered states are not just all about healing. As I said, they're about creativity. And part mm -hmm. of the corollary is that these medicines and these alkaloids are useful for other things besides hallucinating. For example, uh, there's a scientist in, in New Orleans at the LSU Medical Center who's looking at sub doses, that is tiny doses of these things for treating asthma. Mm -hmm. You know, beta blockers, one of the most important cardiac drugs worth billions and billions of dollars uh, is based in part on compounds that were extracted from the magic mushrooms. So the fact that these things can cause your mind and your brain and your soul and your spirit to do uh, wild things and take you to wild places, there may be another therapeutic aspect to this. I mean, look at microdosing. I don't understand it scientifically. But I use it sometimes. I don't understand acupuncture scientifically, but I use it sometimes. So we need to get away from this idea that, you know, the only way you can be cured is by a white guy in a white coat with a scalpel. Right. Right. Even though, you know, I mean, science has its, its greatest gifts that it's given to all of us. But there is other, I mean, usually they say it's really close to us, whatever needs to cure us. You know, Tara, I mean, if you have uh, appendicitis, you should not be seeking a medium, okay? Yeah. <laughs> but if you have a deep-seated emotional issue, you should not be seeing a physician. Yeah. These are different things. Every system of healing does something well, okay? If Ayurvedic medicine didn't work, and I don't understand how it works, uh, how come there's so many Hindustani people in the world? Obviously it does some things very well, just like our medicine, just like shamanic medicine, just like Chinese medicine. And fortunately, we're in an age where there's increased appreciation and space for these different modalities. The problem, from my perspective, as an ethnobotanist and folk in the Amazon for four decades, is that as we're beginning to appreciate these plants and fungi as never before, as we're going to appreciate these shamans as never before, they're disappearing faster than ever before. Mm -hmm. So we're burning the candle at both ends. And I have a lot of students always hitting on me for career advice, that is, uh, saying, okay, well, you know, how can I be an ethnobotanist if yeah. there's no jobs in ethnobotany and academia? And I'm like, there are billion dollar companies being created around psilocybin, and you think there's no jobs? I mean, I know unemployed physicians, and I know unemployed lawyers, and you're saying there's no jobs? This is the psychedelic renaissance. Yes. Open that third eye. Look at the yeah. possibilities out there. And here's where your expertise comes in here. There aren't enough people uh, with gifts that are at the table helping us make decisions about when do you go to a doctor and when do you go to a medium and when do you go to a shaman and when do you go to an herbalist and when do you go to a pet therapist? Because these are not the same thing. There's not enough guides. Any, when I'm asked by 19 year olds, you know, what career possibilities are out there? My answer is always the same, tattoo removal. <laughs> when, when, when your generation is my age this is going to be booming i guarantee right. <laughs> it is it is it's going to be booming all of us who know what tattoos look like 40 years later do not get tattoos right? no right so but secondly psychedelic guides everybody wants to try these things whether it's an experiment or whether you've got insomnia or whether you're dealing with some issue, who's right. going to guide them? There's not right. enough shamans to go around. Right. There's lots of rent to shamans, but I wouldn't put my brain and soul into their hands. So finding the guides, creating the guides, creating the space. I want to get to a place where there are guides that are licensed that you can go to and you, 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 you can trust them. 
instead of right now, well, I know a friend who's got a cousin who had a, 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 an uncle who knew this girl. That's where we are now. Let me give you an example. I tried to find a guy, okay? And here's why. People say to me all the time, cool, what's the difference between doing shamans, uh, mushrooms in Oaxaca and doing mushrooms or, or straight psilocybin with a guide here in the States? Uh, what's the difference between doing ayahuasca with a guide in Berkeley uh, or in the Northwest Amazon? Well, here's the honest answer. I don't know. I've done plenty of ayahuasca machines in the Northwest Amazon. I lived in Oaxaca and went through plenty of Alala mushroom ceremonies there, but I've never done it with a guide. So about a year ago, I said, I'm going to find a guide and I'm going to do it so I can answer this question because people think I'm an ethnobotanical snob. Like, oh, well, you just think if you're not doing it with a shaman. No. I mean, to me, that's the, that's the root of the tree of knowledge to be doing it in the right cultural context. But for comparative but purposes, I want to be able to say, well, I did it with a guide and she did. I couldn't find a guide. It took me a year. I found two guides. One wanted $2,000, and that was a discount because I was an ethnobotanist. The other wanted $5,000. Well, when I did it in Oaxaca, the shaman wanted a flashlight with two extra batteries. <laughs> okay. That was, it makes it an easy choice. Yeah. I want to get to a place where the shamans are, 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 are asking what they're truly worth and where people don't have to have $5,000 to blow uh, to find a professional guide. There's a sweet spot in there, but uh, I haven't found it yet. Right. In the, uh, in the, 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 the countries where, you, you know, it's indigenous, um, is it a, a way of life? Is it a um, more built into, you know, like the, the, the shaman or the, the guide down in, um, Oaxaca is, is going to be just more attuned to maybe what it is that, that you're, you're seeking as far as an experience. Well, it's an excellent question, Jason. And that gets back to my point. I don't know because I haven't done it outside the context. Okay. I mean, I've done ayahuasca in the States with, with real ayahuasca shamans from Colombia who were, who were traveling for a variety of reasons. Yeah. But the, I suspect uh, it's going to be like a Venn diagram where there's overlap where a lot of it's going to be the same because you're taking the same alkaloids. But the question is, is shamanic healing just about the alkaloids or other chemical compounds they're using? I don't think so. I think Western medicine is built on two pillars. One is the chemistry, what's in the pills. The other is the technology, CAT scans, x-rays, whatever. I think that shamanic medicine in the broad sense, not just talking about you know indigenous guys in the rainforest of the Americas, but kind of like what Tara does, is built on two things, which is the chemicals, which is in the plants, and the, the mystical, the spiritual, the invisible, whatever you want to call it. I don't understand it. I'm not sure that I can, okay? But it doesn't stop me from using it because it works. So that's a long answer to a, a short question. The short answer to your question is, I don't know. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of overlap, but I, I, I cannot believe it's exactly the same thing in all cases. Right. I mean, that's, that's an honest way, <laughs> you know, that's the honest answer is, is sometimes I don't know the mechanics of it, but do you think that, that people like that they, they thirst for a connection or a deeper connection with their own, uh, with their own life, you know, as, as, as why maybe. they would like, why they would, you know, uh, you know, seek a, uh, a substance or, you know, whatever people seek to, to deepen their, their own experience. Now you're talking about the shamans, you're talking about the patients. Uh, no, the, the, like the, the, the patients or the, yeah. the, the clients, the, uh, the, the people who would, who would, who, who would like, you know, start to, you know, microdose or, or go through a, I, I would, I would break it into two cohorts. One would be sick people. Okay. I mean, all of us are sick in some way. You can't go through life without having dents in your fender, right? You're stressed out because you're fighting with your partner or you're not sure you can meet payroll or there's somebody at work that's driving you crazy. Stress is part of the human condition. And, and when I say patients, I mean, these are terminal cancer patients who are dying to people who are just like, nah, I don't know, you know, I have some digestive issues. Runs a gamut. The yeah. second are people who are just curious. You know, Andrew Weil, everybody knows Andy Weil is the great yeah. physician. What very few people realize is that Andy started out as an ethnobotanist. Andy had the same mentor I did. It was Richard Schultes at Harvard. Okay, so Andy started out 
on, on the fringe uh, as a boundary walker yeah. before he became a conventional physician at Harvard Medical School. The point here being that uh, Andy wrote a book a long time ago, decades and decades and decades ago, where he said, wanting to experience altered states is, is human nature. And if not, why do five-year-olds spin around till they fall over? Mm -hmm. Right? Why do people want to have a drink when they come home from work? Uh, why do people want to take hallucinogenic mushrooms if there's nothing seriously wrong with them? And part of us just want to have that out-of-body experience where we can float up and look down at ourselves, uh, metaphorically or, or, or actually or spiritually, depending on how you, you cut the mustard. So why would you say that one is an experiment and the other is healing, when from the shamanic perspective, it's all the same, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've done many ayahuasca experiences where, to me, nothing happened. And when I'd say to the shaman, nothing happened, they say, oh, no, you got what you needed. You know, you want to see a light show? Go to Disneyland. Uh, that the remedio, the medicine, is giving you what you need. And sometimes you go into the ninth dimension and you make love with the goddess of the river under the water. And sometimes you go to sleep and wake up nine hours later, refreshed. Mm -hmm. So that uh, this is where the magic comes in. You know, you cannot explain to me, Tara, uh, every, everything about how you work in a way that I will understand. True. Even if you tried, even if True. you tried, you could. Uh, when we were friends for decades, I couldn't yeah. understand it. It's a different yeah. language, okay? Yeah. So why would I be able to understand what an Amazonian shaman is who's from such a different culture and reality than we are? And either you can respect it or you can do something very stupid, which is say, I don't understand it, so it's bullshit. Okay. Yeah. And 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 most people are obviously somewhere in between, and more and more people are entering there. But with all of the people clamoring for alternative healing, and let's face it, alternative healing is healing. Western medicine is only two or three hundred years old. Yeah. So the idea that shamanic medicine is some sort of new thing that was created in in the hot tubs at Esalen is bullshit. Right. Yeah. You got to respect that. Well, wasn't the first medical uh, school 1910 in Edinburgh, Scotland? I think that was, that the, was first one of the first medical school. The, I think there was earlier ones in Italy, but you know, it depends on yeah. how you, it, the point is nobody's saying it was 10,000 years ago. So the in, Italians in the started it? <laughs> yeah, well, the Italians know a lot about life. We're still figuring out it, right? <laughs> but the, 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 the point being is that, uh, you know, fire wasn't invented by a scientist. OK, uh, the wheel was not invented by somebody who wanted to do uh, an initial public offering and get rich. All of these things were created by human ingenuity before there was a profit motive. So the idea that if you can buy something at the health food store and can't do uh, what what a, what a, a surgeon could do because he's charging you more money, so it must be much better. Not true. Right. Right. I mean, we, I mean, it, it's all preventative anyway, right? So if you're going to do these, these uh, microdosing and, and searching for God, I always say it's searching for God. But mm -hmm. um, when you're doing that, you know, I mean, you, you need to have that in mind and not be searching for God every weekend, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, it sounds like it's searching for the goddess the river goddess hey, yeah. or, or the goddess who's under the river. That's <laughs> what it sounds like. <laughs> are, are you injecting monotheism in the debate? <laughs> uh, but, you know, Timothy Leary always talked about set and setting. Talk about reductionist. What about intention, which is where your point comes in, Tara, yeah. about what do you want to get out of it? What are you searching for? Is it the God? Is it the goddess? Or is it goodness? Again, why choose? And Timothy Leary talked about set and setting. He left out the most important S, the shaman. Mm -hmm. All right. If these guys have been doing these things for thousands of years, you think you figured out because because you read something on the internet? I don't think so. Uh, which is why it's so exciting, but in in in, in some ways so challenging because there's going to be a lot of bad uh, stories of people that that took too much or, or came apart because they didn't do it with a, a knowledgeable guy, or they got the dosage wrong. And, you know, in my latest episode of, of the podcast, which is on uh, absinthe, which is the, the, the creative juice par excellence in terms of alcohol, uh, I, I uncovered the story of this French engineer who had overdone her on absinthe. 
and he was trying to uh, demolish a building on, on the corner, but because he drank too much absinthe, uh, he got the dosage wrong in terms of the dynamite, and he leveled the whole city block. <laughs> oh my God! Did he kill everybody so, in the? I I, I don't know oh. the denouement, but the point being that dosage is important uh, on more than just uh, hallucinogens. <laughs> Oh my God. Isn't, uh, isn't that like a mint drink that has like a worm in it or something that no. they chew? What is up, that? What is, I, when you know, I'm mixing? I've, ca I've caused some controversy when I start including uh, alcohol in a series on right. mind altering substances, which of course alcohol right. is. So I did right. an episode on rum. I did an episode on uh, absinthe. Uh, but it did an episode on wine because these are all things that have impacted our culture in a big way. Mm -hmm. Now, absinthe is, is based on wormwood. Wormwood is the source of the taste of licorice, which everybody knows, anise, pastiche, things like that, are all based on wormwood. Now, a couple of years ago, a Chinese uh, chemist, a woman, won the Nobel Prize, I think it was 2015, for finding a new cure for malaria, which was wormwood. Well, shortly before that, I was in Italy and I was visiting the ruins of Pompeii and there growing on uh, a garden plot was wormwood. And one of the things which led to the downfall of the Roman Empire was malaria. So what ethnobotanists don't do is discover things. We rediscover things that uh, indigenous peoples and ancient cultures figured out long before we got there. So. Uh, absinthe is based on wormwood, and the the, the uh, worm in the bottle is tequila and mezcal, and all these drinks based on agave in Mexico. And at some point, I'll get around to doing a uh, episode on that. But really, the the the, the godfather, the grandfather, the father of this uh, study of the relationship between people and their plants was my mentor Schultes. In fact, I have an article on him in the current issue of Harvard Magazine, harvardmagazine.com. Okay. Uh, maybe you can link to it in the show notes. Yeah, that'd uh, be great. Where I talk about his role. This is a guy who did the seminal work on peyote in the 30s. This is the first study, as far as I know, of living and working and dripping with indigenous peoples uh, in terms of peyote. So he helped bring mescaline to the wider world. And of course, this is what literally turned on Aldous Huxley, who wrote The Doors of Perception, which turned on Jim Morrison, which led to The Doors. Uh, and then from uh, the Kiowa peoples in Oklahoma, he then went to Oklahoma. I mean, he went and went to Oaxaca, where he discovered, discovered magic mushrooms. Nobody knew there were magic mushrooms in North America uh, or that people were using them anywhere in, in America until he found it. And so in so doing, he brought psilocybin to the white world. Imagine this, by the time the man was 26, he brought mescaline and psilocybin to the wider world. And then went on to discover ayahuasca. That is a career which will uh, never be equaled. Mm -hmm. No, that, I mean, he was, what was he looking for, do you think? In the knowledge. beginning, just knowledge? Just knowledge. I mean, you know, his discoveries led to beta blockers. It was a billion dollar industry. He yeah. never profited from that. He wasn't no. interested in money. You know, I mean, he had a job, he had tenure, he worked at an academic institution, but he was never, you know, greedy about it. It was never all about, okay, I'm gonna take this and bring it to the lab and get rich. We right. shared this information, published in academic journals. Now I will say this, we don't live in an age where you can or should do this, where you take indigenous wisdom and put it out there for people to, to benefit commercially. Indigenous peoples have to benefit first and foremost. The governments of these countries have to benefit second most, and then we should benefit third most. So a lot of discussion is now that commercializing psilocybin, a lot of discussion now that cannabis is a billion dollar industry. You know, how to benefit nature, how to benefit the indigenous peoples, how to benefit the center of origin. Uh, that, that type of approach is long overdue. And I worry that, you know, the, the psilocybin's out of the bottle. Psilocybin, toothpaste out of the tube, psilocybin's out of the mushroom. It's already out there. Right. But going forward, this is, we need to learn from these past mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think that that um, instructs the, the type of creati creativity that, uh, that can be produced from, you know, the, these substances as far as like the, 
you know, because we, we look for for quality, right? In in every creative effort, you know, not where just someone just blah, you know, <laughs> you know puts it out there that it's like we, we, we look to to see that uh, it, it adds up to something too, you know, that it that enhances our our, our way of life. You know, it's like the the computer, for instance, right? That that like came about because there were a lot of stone kids, you know, who who created um, right. like our, our uh, uh, laptops and you know stuff like that, you know. But uh, what do you think? I think anybody who's interested in in the human species, which should include all humans, has got to be interested in the nature of creativity. You know, how do people invent fire? How do people invent wine? And how do I figure out how to invent the next uh, iPad, right? Uh, what is it in our species that, that has uh, launches creativity? And that's why I, I, I use the term idea gen, okay? I, it generates ideas. And anybody who's interested in new ideas knows that many new ideas, if not most ideas, are bad, <laughs> or at least not great ideas. Yeah. And how do you figure out what's going to lead to the iPad and, and what's going to lead to the Edsel, right? And, and, and <laughs> how do gonna... you enhance? Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and then there's the, the pool noodle. You know, I mean, people come up with the silliest stuff and, you know, I mean, it's like that creative edge. Yeah. Of, you know, Ag agreed. And, you simple know, this things. Whole idea, the creativity involves some old white guy sitting at a lab bench going Eureka. Mm -mm. I, I think we, we all know that that's way too simple. I mean, Kerry Mullis on his motorcycle with LSD and his blood coming up with PCR. And I read something recently where it said, actually, discoveries are not when some guy sits up and says, Eureka. It's when somebody in the lab says, holy shit, that's weird. <laughs> I think that's probably a, a more right. realistic that's assessment. It's like a happy but, accident. <laughs> but how many, how many times have we tried to figure out the solution to a problem whether it's, it's meeting payroll or coming up with some new uh, coding where you just gave up and went to sleep and woke up and said, holy shit, I got it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or, or maybe you did a mushroom trip and you got it. Or maybe you hadn't thought of something in years and it popped into your head. And, and this is what makes the, the whole process mysterious. But I will say this, that I think we need to recognize the potential of these mind-altering substances of these mind altering processes, not just about uh, mushrooms, uh, about meditation. How do we use meditation to enhance creativity? And, and Terry, you know a lot more about that than oh, I Oh, yeah. How, how do we use sleep to enhance creativity? How do we listen to these uh, wonderful uh, trance tracks that you've laid down and enhance creativity? Instead of saying, uh, I'll just sit around until the idea pops in my head. Maybe it'll work. More likely yeah, no. than not, it won't. Yeah. No, I, I believe that, you know, and meditation is your first go-to. And then, yep. you know, if you need a little boost, then, you know, you build a team or you have to do things like, you know, like a, a microdosing, I don't think is a bad bad um, way if you're just so depressed about the world. But, you you know, it's the old adage of, you know, uh chop wood carry water you're obviously not doing something with your life that you need to you know there's i think that that's well put and and i do want to touch on this microdosing thing because there's so yeah. much interest in it and yeah. and we don't really understand it we sort of think we kind of do but there's yeah. not enough experiments to prove the value although people swear by it of course that's how science begins you have a hypothesis you don't start out with a proof you have an idea that something does something and then you test it now, the, the, the microdosing protocol that I'm most interested in these days is what's known as the Stamets stack, S-T-A-M-E-T-S. -E Paul Stamets is the leading ethnomycologist of our day in terms of bringing mushrooms to the masses. I mean, this guy's trying to solve bee colony collapse with antivirals from mushrooms, trying to gobble up toxic waste using mushrooms. But he's come up with a protocol, which makes sense to me, called the Stamet stack, S-T-A-M-E-T-S stack, which involves uh, psilocybin, tiny amounts, mm -hmm. lion's mane, which is an important mushroom that everybody should know and, and mm -hmm. consume, and niacin, vitamin B3, I think. There's lots of the stuff on the internet. So I, I'm not telling people what to do. I'm encouraging people to do your own research. And don't believe everything 
you uh, read on the internet, don't believe everything you hear from National Botanist. Uh, do the research. <laughs> No, I think that you are great as far as like, if anybody's going to be able to take some advice, you're the one to give it. You oh, would, kind you of are great. Say, but I, I always take your advice. So we're even. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Thank goodness. We're, we're, well, I mean, that's our role in life too, is to really lead people out of misery and, and uh, heartache. I think creating paths is, is very important. Sometimes leading people, sometimes just showing them the path, sometimes just encouraging them, sometimes yeah. giving them a, a kick in the ass. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it, it, it all true. works. And, and, right. And, but you have to know when to do what. You right. can't use any one of those on everybody. Right, right, right. It's true. Well, yeah, I do a lot of hand holding and meditation, helping them, hyp hypnotherapy. Well, I, you know, I, I was asked to define how to do ethnobotanical research very simply. And I said, I can do it in three sentences. Yeah. One, no one to lean forward. Two, no one to lean back. Three, no one to shut the hell up. Mm -hmm. The point being that you can't do research with these people if you're just badgering them all the time. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just got to be with people. So you got to just listen to people, go fishing with people, go hunting with people, eat with people. This idea that you march in and say, you know, fork over the next psilocybin or do you guys know how to cure diabetes it doesn't work that way well that's a i love that story about diabetes you know where they use insulin here in the western world but in the amazon they would go to that tree and just get some a serum out of it right and they would be good well, for what 28 days there's a lot of diabetes in my family on both sides i'm very interested in diabetes and i mm -hmm. emphasize i'm not a physician but uh, I've seen them drop blood sugar uh, through the floor using three plants, and it was good for a month. Yeah, um, right. So I would certainly prefer to use this treatment to uh, insulin injections or any injections for that matter. I hate needles. But again, I go back to the point that science begins with hypothesis. You don't see one shaman using one concoction and say, Eureka, I found the cure for cancer. Right, right. Okay. It needs to be examined further. And I emphasize that I'm, I'm a, I run a not-for-profit. I don't work for pharmaceutical companies. I'm not trying to cure anybody or make any money doing it. My job at the Amazon Conservation Team is to work in partnership with indigenous peoples to help them protect their rainforests, their rivers, and their cultures. Uh, it's not to tell them what to do. That doesn't work. And it's not to go down there and come back with a cure for X and get it on the market. Yeah. I know. It's great. So in, in your new book, the, the Amazon, what everyone needs to know that that is available on, on Amazon. Yes. It's available <laughs> everywhere. It's, it's yes. actually, it's part of our interesting series. Oxford press said, yeah. you know, we're all pressed for time in the old days. If you're interested in something and read a book, it was 400 page long. Now people are writing 700 page books on things, mm -hmm. but there are a lot of issues where you can't learn as much as you want off a website, but you don't want 700 pages on it. Right. So they'll do a book on climate change. They'll find an expert and say, what are the 40 questions you're always asked that people need to know? So this is part of the series. So they said to me, uh, you know, come up with the 40 or 60 questions about the Amazon. You know, what's the effect on climate change? Uh, do piranhas really eat people? What is ayahuasca? Oh yeah, no, that's a that is the number one. Do piranhas really? Do they? <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, they. <laughs> it's like so ah, very yeah. very seldom, but okay. it does happen. All right. And and yes, anaconda uh, and yes, uh, uh, black caimans do eat people. Uh, <laughs> and yes, uh, you know sharks, bull sharks, which I'm convinced will the real sharks behind. The Jaws story, not not great white sharks. Mm -hmm. uh, bull sharks go all the way up the Amazon more than three thousand miles. Sure. So you not only have uh, man eating, what's the term these days? People eating crocodilians mm -hmm. and piranhas. You have people eating sharks as well. <clears throat> yeah. Well, they can't. Hear, they can hear you, but you can't hear it them. Is is the Amazon? Is it for the the faint of heart to actually go and and to uh, visit? Look, you can get hit on the head in D.C., okay? You can get shot in Los Angeles. Uh, the Amazon's like any other place. You have to know what you're doing, know where to go, where not to go. 
uh, and ideally have somebody with you. There's parts of LA I'd go to with a friend from that neighborhood, but I sure wouldn't wander in on my own. Okay. Yeah. Amazon's the same thing. Yeah, in the you dark. Don't... Yeah, you don't do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, you don't wander into an indigenous village without an invitation or a guide or a member of the tribe that invited you. Why would you wouldn't do it in, in Los Angeles? You wouldn't do it in Amazon. Right. Nice. Nice. And uh um what uh what are you working on next? Well, I want to do a, a, a paper on the history of hallucinogens at Harvard because the psychedelic renaissance is well underway. It's revolutionizing the treatment of PTSD, stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, end of life, anxiety. I mean, the list goes on. Yeah. But uh, Harvard, like every other major institution, is jumping on the bandwagon. But Harvard doesn't understand that she invented this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. through Schulte's work. And it goes back further than Schulte's. William James, the father of American psychology, uh, everybody knows his name, nobody's read his stuff, uh, went to the Amazon in 1865. Mm -hmm. So that was a formative experience in him understanding the human psyche because this is a rich uh, white guy from Boston whose idea of diversity was going to Europe and hanging out with rich white guys from Europe. All of a sudden, <laughs> yeah. he's in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. He's hanging out with indigenous peoples, Afro-Amazonians, military. And I think this is a formative experience. He did come back. He did try peyote, not peyote, not from the Amazon, I know. I don't want to hate mail. Uh, it's from the Texas, Mexico border region. Right. But uh, James spent his whole academic career at Harvard. We're talking the, the 1860s here, okay? Um, and so I want to lay out the case for why it began at Harvard and how it spread elsewhere. And, uh, I, you know, I'm just an intellectual magpie. I'm just interesting, cool stuff. And so that's my next big project. More important than that is my professional stuff, which is running and managing and fundraising for the Amazon Conservation Team. In our 26 years, we have partnered with over 100 tribes uh, to map, manage, and improve protection of over 90 million acres of ancestral rainforest. No other conservation organization can make that claim. And there are other conservation organizations with more than 10 times our budget. But our secret sauce is working in partnership with indigenous peoples. Instead of trying to decide the fate of the rainforest in Washington or New York or, or Paris or London, so far it's working well. Yeah, it's great. So, and I think it's very funny because I went to um, when, oh gosh, it was so many years ago. Now it's probably like 15. I, I got into my son's place in New York. Uh, he lived in Queens, I think at the time. And here you were on the TV and you guys were on a commercial tracking the rainforest. And it was so funny. It was just like, yeah, was... I'm in New York City and here you are. Yeah, it was hilarious. <laughs> well, there's an interesting backstory to that. Yeah. Jeff Bridges, the yeah. beloved actor is on our yes. board of advisors and mm -hmm. he was doing voiceovers for Duracell. Mm -hmm. And so at one point he called me up and he said, you guys use Duracell for anything in, in, in the Amazon? I said, are you kidding? That's all we use. Those are the best batteries out there. I've got naked indigenous peoples and the Brazilian Shingu saying, we don't want these crappy Chinese batteries. We want Duracell. <laughs> so we, we did a, a, a commercial then, uh, yeah. with, with Jeff narrating. Uh, for Duracell about using the batteries to, you know, it's just got to work. Whether you're putting batteries in your kids' toys Christmas morning or whether you're saving the rainforest, it's got to work. That right. was the most successful commercial in the history of, of Duracell batteries. It's supposed to run for three months. It ran for close to a year, made it all the way to the World Series. I mean, we couldn't, <laughs> we, we couldn't pay for that kind of coverage, yeah. you know. And when you're a, a not-for-profit, you shouldn't be paying for that kind of coverage. You should be leveraging your contacts and ideas to get your ideas into the marketplace uh, for free or at somebody else's expense. All right. It was great. It was great. It was one of those moments that it was just like, there's Mark. <laughs> yeah, very shamanic. I, I love say. it. I would, I would say too. Very connected. Very connected. So now, um, so Jason, Jason, you know, has, uh, you know, a million sold ohms throughout the world. And what is your next project? Can we give your website and uh, what are you doing? 
Um, I, I am currently writing a, a book on uh, the, the energy of, of Tarot and looking at the, the cycles and all of the, the, the phases that, that one goes through when they are manifesting their, their vision. And, you know, it's, it's like a, a lot of what I, I see with people is, is how they uh, set the stage within themselves. And, and that can be, you know, through meditation, that can be through um, that expansion, whether it's through natural means um, or, or if they are, you know, uh, going, going in through, uh, uh, you know, boosting it, <laughs> you know, with uh, other means, if they are, uh, you know, t tapping in, right, to, to a, a way of, of getting the, they're, they're setting their own, their own stage, and then activating it, putting it uh, into, into motion, taking the steps, and, and not getting too, too flustered, you know, like when they, when a, when a dream starts to come into um, it, the, the physical, you know, it, it, it can take some work. It can take some, some, um, some flexibility in, in how one makes it work. You know, the, what comes to mind, Jason, when you talk about the role is an overlooked aspect of that milieu, and, and that is the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's why I, I draw that weird analogy, because you had these people there in New England at the time, uh, Emerson, uh, Longfellow, Thoreau. It's kind of like Liverpool in the early 60s. You had these, you know, a, a handful of guys came together and changed the world. Same thing yeah. with the American Revolution. Same thing with classical Greece. And lightning strikes very rarely. I mean, I think, uh, uh, to give another weird analogy, why didn't that happen in Iraq after the invasion that you had the Iraqi Jefferson and the Iraqi Adams and the Iraqi Washington emerge? And the answer is, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. And, and if you're looking at Thoreau, that was one of those rare occasions in human history where lightning struck yeah. and, and, and a bunch of geniuses came together and the, 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 the circumstance, right, set and setting uh, uh, will, will help make this happen. Anyhow, I don't want to go off on this. Tangent. No, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And we, yeah, I know. No, it is. It is wonderful. And, you know, it's like finding, you know, your, your own lightning right your own lightning strike some sometimes you um you know can just set the stage for it for that exactly. that environment to you know create the the lightning and you know it's like you don't sit around just like you know trying to force it you know it's like you you set the intention and then you um you you move forward on on your your vision and and then you know it's like you can meet the people that that you need to meet you can um you know, create these, these possibilities, but, you know, one has to do it. One has to, to act on it. Um, so you know, the, I'm, the, the, there's ahead. a great quote from Louis Pasteur that I like a lot, which is chance favors a prepared mind. Yeah. You trying to, to come to behind the curtain. How to get, yeah. How to get lightning to strike, but it's got to strike in the right place. It's got to strike at the right time and you got to be ready. We've all yeah. had instances in our lives where we missed an opportunity for whatever reason. Okay. So it's not just, okay, if the lightning strikes, shit happens in a good way. Right. Not always. <laughs> not always. Well, we know that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of lightning that strikes that doesn't necessarily come down. And, and I mean, it, but, you know, that's the, that's the thing that we've been really talking about this whole hour is that, you know, make something count. Like if you're going to do, um, you know, open your mind, then what is it that you would like to achieve? What is mm -hmm. it that you would like to change? What is it that you would like to see as a solution in the world? You know, I mean, it's not about just getting high or, or being blissed out. I mean, there are solutions in the world and how we can progress in our lives, whether it's an invention or making more money or, you know, healing yourself or healing your mind because that's a big thing you know we have to stay centered to get what we want and maybe that's where lightning starts to strike is when we have all these components that we say oh no no we can work on something else besides just our whatever entertainment or our you know i'd like to hear an hour of this from you without <laughs> Just me listening, not 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 speaking. So put that on the agenda. How does right. it lightning the strike in your own life? Right, right. Come on, let's go. I love it. I love it. 
Okay, so where can people find you, Mark? Okay, I am easily findable on the Amazon team website, amazonteam.org. You can also find me on my personal website, markplotkin.com. And the podcast is Plants of the Gods, uh, Hallucinogens, Healing, Health, and Culture. Uh, that's available on all podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, mm -hmm. and uh, my most I recent book. probably everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And my most recent book, The Amazon, What Everyone Needs to Know, uh, you can buy at Amazon.com. But I prefer that you don't. I prefer that you patronize your local bookstore. And if they don't have it, you can then buy it from Amazon.com. Yeah, that sounds great. I agree. And so, Jason, did you say your website? I didn't, actually. Ah. But uh, it's Jason D. McKean, J-A-S-O-N-D, as in Dragon Lord. Uh, <laughs> McKean, M-C-K-E-A-N.com. And, right. um, and then also on Facebook and Instagram, Jason Terrell Wizard. Yeah, and Jason has like four books out this year and one cool. of them translated into Japanese. So yeah. can you tell the title of uh, your main book? Oh, um, yeah. Magic Channel Tarot Reading with the Tarot Wizard. Right. Do you have the Japanese version there too? Uh, I wanted him to say the title in Japanese. That's yeah, right. yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah. You know, I have a, a, a <laughs> class in Japan coming up. At you the, do? Uh, yeah, at the beginning of July. Okay. But it is through a translator. So, um, you know, I, I would be completely lost. Watashi wa nihongo ga skoshi anashimasu. Skoshi. Okay. <laughs> Very good. I love it. How and about you, Tara? Where are you? You can find me at terrainsight.com. And I am going to plan a few retreats for the fall. So they should be fun. Give, give, give us your Twitter handle. Tara. Oh, yeah. Tara Sutphin. And it's uh, Tara, Tara Insight, maybe my Twitter handle. And Tara Sutphin, is, you can find me all over the internet. And um, so it's T-A-R-A-S-U-T-P-H-E-N. On Twitter, I'm at Doc Mark Plotkin, D O C M A R K P L O T K I N. Right. So join both of us, join all three of us there. Right, there or in Instagram too. We're all on Instagram. Tara underscore insight. What are you on Instagram? Uh, I have people doing my Instagram account. Oh, That's okay. one I haven't figured out myself yet. All right. So, but you're on probably Amazon team, right? And uh, I think that's who I, I usually click into when mm -hmm. I want to tag you. And how about um, you, Jason? Jason Tarot Wizard? Jason Tarot Wizard, yes. On, uh, <laughs> I love it. Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was really great to talk Fantastic. to you. Fantastic. My mind yeah. is blown. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we all want <laughs> lightning and strike. <laughs> okay. We're going to work on that. <laughs> okay. Great, guys. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And once you get this up, let me know so I can cross promote it. I will. Okay. I love okay. you. Let's I love talk you, Mark. Soon. Love you, Jason. Love, guys. Yeah. Talk to you guys soon. Lots of love. Bye. Be safe. Blessings, everyone. Lots of love. That was wonderful.